Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Tiffany Rvalkava and I am a program coordinator here at UC Irvine's Division of Continuing Education. We welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us for our Exploring Types of Data Analysis a webinar series. Um, so this is a series. There will be three parts to this. Uh, this is the first one and we will be focusing, focusing on descriptive analytics, which is one of the main types of um, data analytics. So we'll just go ahead and get started. As I mentioned before, this session is being recorded. Um, and then once it is ready, you will get an email and then it will also be posted on our UCI DCE for events page. That way you can all watch it again later. Okay, so here is a quick um, outline of our session today. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with an overview um, of the Division of Continuing Education along with the Technology Programs Department. And then we'll move on to a um, to a little bit of information on our data analytics for business certificate program that we offer here at DCE. And um, then we'll move on to a panelist introduction. And then our panelists will go on to a presentation um, of descriptive analytics. And then uh, I will discuss with you all the different courses that we are offering in the winter um, as part of our data analytics program. And then we'll end it with a Q&A session. Um, so if you have questions, you can feel free to save them um, for the end. You can unmute yourselves at the end or type them in the chat room, um, or you can send them in the chat or in the Q&A function. I'm available at the bottom of your bar and then they'll kind of just get queued up and we'll answer them once we have time. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get right into it. Um, so what is UCI Division of Continuing Education? Um, so we offer courses both on campus and online. Um, the Data Analytics Certificate Program is an online certificate program. Um, so it's completely online. There are some live components to them, like Zoom sessions that our instructors host, um, but you do learn about that once you enroll into a course. We let you know ahead of time the timings and the days for those sessions. And um, we offer courses in different, um, in different categories, including STEM, pre-med, humanities, business, and the social sciences. I um, mean, we welcome both students and professionals from around the world. And we have um, international students that join us for our international programs, and then we have um, working professionals that join our certificate programs. And if you want to find out more information, you can visit our website, ce.uci.edu. Okay, so a little bit about who Technology Programs is. Um, again, I am Tiffany Dovalcava. I am one of the program coordinators in our department. Um, I work alongside Amy Kim and Julie Pei, and we all oversee the different technology-based certificate programs that we offer here at DCE. Um, so on this slide, you have our personal emails and phone numbers along with our um, department email address. So if you have any questions um, after this presentation, you can feel free to take a little picture of this slide, um, send us an email, and then we will get back to you. Okay. So about our data analytics for business certificate program, um, as I mentioned, this is an online program. Um, and the focus of this is students will essentially learn the basics of collecting, storing, and analyzing data. Um, and through that, we will go, we have like courses in the three main types of data analytics. And so that includes descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. And so in those courses, you'll learn um, how to essentially do that type of, that type of like data analysis with different tools that um, professionals use in the industry. Um, and then on this slide, you should be seeing a image here. And this is a picture of our course schedule. And so that includes our required courses. There are currently three required courses in our program. Um, it starts with introduction to analyzing data for business goals. Um, so that is a very fundamental course um, on what data analytics is essentially. And then you move on through to the three types of uh, main data analysis. And so that's descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. And then you end with a data retrieval prep and management course, which is all about how you find data, how you clean it, and how you can use it um, to analyze and then make business decisions. And then we do have um, elective courses in our program. The requirement is that you complete a minimum of 1.5 units, and then you can fulfill that requirement by taking any one of these courses. Again, if you have any questions about the program, feel free to type them in the chat, or you can go ahead and ask them at the end. Okay, so now I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, his name is James Yang. He has experience in um, advertising, sorry, in advising international startups um, in the fintech and data science industries. Um, and his experience and background comes from 
working and starting and selling different companies throughout his career. Um, he helped provide basically a practical understanding of data analytics. Um, he is really good at it. He is one of our favorite instructors. Um, so I will go ahead and pass it over to you, James. Thank you for being here. All right, thank you very much, Tiffany. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I just wanna give a brief introduction to descriptive analytics. I'll talk briefly about how we perceive of descriptive analytics in the program. I'll talk a little bit about analytics and practice, and then go through a high level view of the course and what you'll be accomplishing in that course. And then a short demo to go through the software and techniques that you'll be learning throughout the course. So, Here's a little view of my, my background broken down by industry. And I show this to, to basically impress upon you that descriptive analytics undercuts many, many different industries. And the techniques and, and skill sets that you learn in descriptive analytics is the same no matter whether you're doing engineering, investment management, or business operations and decision making. So the core skill set for descriptive analytics is actually the same across all these despite the domain that you're in. And that's how we approach teaching descriptive analytics here, is to provide you the fundamental skills that you can take to any position within any organization, whether in your marketing, sales, operations, strategic business decision-making, and apply them successfully. So first, let's get into this notion of what is descriptive analytics. There are many types of analytics that you've seen in the course program, and descriptive analytics is basically the foundational analytical methods that you need in order to eventually get to a decision-making or optimal uh, action through your organization or business. So descriptive analytics looks at presenting informative aggregate and cross-sectional views of data to understand and show what has happened historically. And so that's the textbook definition of descriptive analytics. But I wanna give you the idea that it's actually much, much more difficult and much more involved than this simple description. So it's more than just querying a database and graphing what you see from the data. There is a giant weakness in most organizations in descriptive analytics, and this flows through. So if we take a look at the analytics maturity model that essentially ranks and classifies these analytical uh, methods, then we can see that the difficulty level of descriptive analytics always falls on the bottom end, and they always rank the value being towards the bottom. And the reason for this is because it's mostly foundational, and it's looking backwards historically on what's happened in the data set. And the data set's more or less a proxy for what's happened in the real world. So through whatever data collection methods you have, you're trying to understand what has happened in the past. And so largely this is not ranked highly on the difficulty level because you're not trying to make any predictions, forecasts, or nor you're trying to suggest a particular course of action. However, they also rank it very low on the value scale, which I actually think is not quite correct. I think in about 95% of the businesses that I've dealt with, most of them are still stuck in the descriptive analytics stage and they do it very, very poorly. And so even trying to understand what has happened is a real hurdle for many of these organizations. And the reason why it's so fundamental is because it's really getting at why did things happen? So in most modern analytics courses, they are now merging descriptive analytics and diagnostic analytics so that not only are you understanding what has happened, but you're trying to understand why did it happen. The reason why they had the split is mostly because of the methods they use in diagnostic analytics. They tend towards more complicated mathematical or statistical models, but you can largely think of them as the same. When we're doing descriptive analytics, we're trying to understand what has happened and why it happened. And this naturally drives us then towards being able to predict what will happen in the future and what course of actions we can take to make it happen or guide the outcome towards something that's more favorable for ourselves. So <clears throat> descriptive analytics is really the most fundamental baseline analytics that you have to be good at before you even attempt to approach predictive analytics or prescriptive analytics. So let's think about it. What information do we need to make decisions? If you are learning to drive a car, you have to make constant decisions when you're driving, either to stop, slow down, turn right, turn left, or continue ahead. And so the basic information that you need is an understanding of what will happen when you take an action. You need to have some mental model of what can happen when you're, say, approaching an intersection. 
And then you need to make mental forecasts of what will happen before you proceed through that intersection. And if you're creating an autonomous car <clears throat> or self-driving car, you need to formalize each of these steps. And so how would we do that? You need to have an understanding of what has happened in the past and how it, and why it happened in the past. And that comes about through your experiences driving. So after you get your learner's permit, you spend months experiencing this and collecting data in order to understand how things happen and why they happened. And so you can take this, this analogy to the business world and you have to ask the same questions. What information do we need to make strategic, operational, or investment decisions? And typically in a business environment, you look at things like key business metrics. So you look at your you know, balance sheet, your income statements, you'll derive your financial ratios, um, you'll graph certainly these properties out to look at trends and growth. And so this, at a superficial level, this is what people are doing when they do business analytics. They are trying to understand what has happened in the past, why it happened, and extrapolate, extrapolate them forward into the future in order to uh, come up with some decision or optimal outcome. And so this particular data comes from the recent New Bank uh, IPO and their F1 filing statements. And so they're presenting a snapshot of what has happened in the past in order to influence your decision of whether or not to invest in their IPO. But for my point of view, this always falls a little bit flat because this only gets at a very superficial component of descriptive analytics. And it only sort of tells you what has happened and not necessarily why it's happened. So to go further into that, we need to ask more and more questions to develop a more comprehensive understanding and we do this by asking questions. And these questions have a natural mapping to various statistical concepts and visual cues. So for instance, a common question might be, what has happened to a stock price over time? And so this question maps to the statistical concept of temporal patterns, which we then can easily graph as time series graphs. Uh, similarly, we might look at the relationships between variables. And so this has a natural mapping to a correlation in a statistical mindset, which then we can visualize again through a graph, either 2D, 3D, or n-dimensional. But this brings up a question of, a sort of a philosophical question of, well, if we're looking at data sets and we're mapping them to statistical properties, what if we had a data set that had all the same statistical proper properties? This could be, say, the uh, quarterly financial metrics of a company from one year to the next. If the quarterly outcomes are the same from year to year, should we consider the performance the same or should we consider them different? And you notice in this data set, it's calculating the <clears throat> mean for an X and Y variable and a standard deviation and correlation all to the hundreds place with the same degree. How about if we visualize that data? Should we be able to refer to these patterns and structures and say that this is how things work? purely visually? Do we even need to go to the statistical models? And so here we can, you know, basically through our visual cognition, we can see patterns emerging, we see shapes forming. Is that how the world actually is? Is that what the data is telling us? Should we rely on that? What if I told you that these data sets are all the same, that the calculated means and standard deviations and correlations all come from these changing data sets? Now, what is your opinion of that? And so these are the types of things that you need to understand when you're looking at descriptive analytics is how do you really understand the world through these rough proxies of the data and visualizations? And it can be good for, be used for good and bad purposes. We see this in the news today. Uh, somebody might have a certain agenda. And so if they show you a graph such as this one, this comes from the UK's Office for National Statistics, the creator of the graph is somebody that had a different motive. And so they aggregated the data and plotted it. And it basically shows you that if you've taken the second vaccine, your mortality rate is actually higher than if you are unvaccinated. And so I'm not trying to make any political statement here. I'm just showing you that visualizations can often lie to you and it can be done intentionally. And so you have to have that mindset when you're doing descriptive analytics of whether or not you're getting to the real truth of what you're seeing or is there something else going on? And in this case, there's something else going on because if you look at the data set broken down by age category, you see that 
the aggregated case definitely shows that mortality rate is higher with vaccinated populations versus unvaccinated populations. However, this is not the whole story because in fact, the individual groups by age shows you that the vaccinations are much more effective than uh, being unvaccinated when it comes to uh, mortality related to COVID. And then this is just really an artifact that comes from Simpson's paradox, which is a phenomenon where the aggregation of data sometimes reverses the trend of constituent individual groups. And this is due to confounding variables. And so these are topics that we cover in the course to prevent you from falling into these fallacies and, and traps that often presented in the news that you might fall into when you're running analytics in your own organization. And you need to be aware of those. And so in this case, we're seeing that, you know, the individual groups might have some positive correlation with vaccination rates and efficacy of uh, preventing uh, COVID infections or mortalities. And then the overall trend actually decreases. So this confounding variable actually flips the picture and you'll see this both in the statistics and the visualizations. And so these are part of the set of skills and techniques that you need to be aware of when you do analytics. So really the idea for this whole course is to enable you to build this mental scaffold of what you're trying to analyze or study. And it comes about by having a good understanding of the data layer, a good understanding of how to do, visualize the data layer and how to craft the best visualizations in order to understand completely what that data set is really trying to tell you. And from that, having the right representational structure of the data then allows you to build a mental scaffold of what is actually going on in the world. And as I said at the very beginning, it doesn't really matter what industry or domain you are in, the techniques and tools are the same. And so once you can get a picture of the data set and the structures, then you can overlay your domain expertise and all the outside knowledge that you have particular to that domain in order to start to build a true understanding of why things happened rather than just look at what actually happened historically. And so a good example of this is when you get to very complex analytics, and this one is using a, a language model. This comes from Word to Vec. And basically in this model, they're creating an n-dimensional space where the proximity of words are semantically related. And this is a, an example of how, if you get your data set into the right structure, really magical things can happen that will make you seem like a hero in your organization. In this particular case, we have all these word vectors here, and we can do something pretty incredible, which is called word vector arithmetic now. Now that we have this represent representation of king and queen in the space, we can do things like, well, let's take the king vector, subtract the man vector, add back the woman vector, and suddenly we're left with this notion of queen. So somehow in this magical representation, we can arrive at these seemingly semantically intentional operations just through data ma manipulation, which is purely mechanical. And this concept really extends to all of analytics, but is really, really key in descriptive analytics in order to structure the data properly such that you can see relationships. And here is an actual visualization of word to vec operating in, I think it's a recipe space showing uh, semantic relationships between uh, ingredients. So seeing the feature spaces allows us to posit hypotheses about why or how events transpired and then you can see that structure. And this is what really gives you insight. So you can plot you know, numbers all day long, you can use Excel and plot charts and bar graphs and line graphs, but it's really more than that. It's really getting at the heart and structure of that feature set, which is what we're after in descriptive analytics. So in practice, there is this notion of the value of analytics over time. And it looks something like this, where you have descriptive analytics so, uh, at some point in time, you'll have some future event, which falls along here. And so the further along that you can identify event root causes, the more you can get a lead time on the actual event occurrence. So if you have a good descriptive analytics base to build a predictive model, you can eventually predict that event, take proactive decisions, and then implement it prior to the event actually happening 
And then your business value that you've captured is the lead time before that event actually occurred. And so this is the holy grail of analytics. It's basically forecasting or classifying events before they've actually happened and making the optimal decision before it's happened. And you notice that it's a loop essentially, because after this event occurrence, we go back to your descriptive analytics, analyzing what has happened and revising our models so that when they feed back into predictive analytics, we can constantly get better and better at uh, forecasting these events. So descriptive an analytics plays this very, very key role here. And in most of the organiza organizations that I've seen, there really is no predictive analytics model. They more or less stop at descriptive analytics and then use some variation of heuristics or even gut instinct to make this event prediction and then take some proactive course. So getting this component is absolutely critical for adding business value. And this is where I see the bulk of organizations spending their budget and their time. There's a good quote uh, from Gordon Gecko from the movie Wall Street, um, which says, the most valuable commodity I know of is information. And so if you've seen that movie, you realize that they spend most of their time trying to capture information about things before they've happened. And they do this through illegal means, through insider trading. But despite that, if you can get a hold of what the real information is ahead of time, that is the most valuable commodity to any business whatsoever, whether you're looking at it from the outside as an investor or looking at it from the inside as somebody in that organization, getting that information is the most valuable aspect for that company. So going from analytics to action then really depends on this pillar of descriptive analytics. The more that we can trust the descriptive analytics, the better the model that we can build. And most importantly, the more we can sell that idea of the course of action based on our descriptive analytics and our prescriptive analytics. So the better we are at selling the analytic outcomes, the better we can convince the business stakeholders in choosing the right course of action. Which leads me to this point here of wearing many hats. Descriptive analytics is not just about technical skills. And we, you'll see this if you take the course, that the course is really split up into these quadrants. And to be a successful analyst these days requires you to have some combination of all of these skills. And this is very, very hard to do. There's a lot of training that is required to be good at any one of these quadrants here. And to be good at all these quadrants is rather difficult. So your team or the individuals that are responsible for analytics in their organization have to represent some superset of all these skills. And what we teach in the course then touches on all these components. So this leads me into the course overview about what we'll be covering. And the main components then are data manipulation and computation, visualization, and then information design and presentation. And you might be wondering, well, how's that different than visualization? Uh, and, it, and it's mostly um, depending on your audience, but it's really about trying to sell the analytics at the end. And that's a really, really key component that a lot of people are not aware of when they're running analytics. They're so focused on the technical aspects that they forget about the, the need to sell the stakeholders on the results of the analytics and to make a convincing argument about why and how things actually transpired. So the first things that you learn in the course are data wrangling, essentially all the techniques that are used for data exploration. If you come from a technical background, you'll be accustomed to these types of operations through SQL or even through Excel. Um, and we'll do this all without touching code or writing uh, SQL queries. Then the next component that you'll have to learn is using the grammar of graphics to map the data into something visual and to make use of cognitive and visual techniques in order to allow the viewer to extract the most information out of your representation. Once we have those techniques, then we'll move to univariate analysis, which is the study of basically variables in isolation. Moving on to multivariate analysis, looking at variables as they relate to one another. Then to time series analysis, introducing this notion of time and how it impacts your variables over time. And then spatial analysis, both in a physical space 
and then conceptual space through network and graph analysis. And this particular one here is mapping the uh, clicks that happen in Game of Thrones. And so you can apply uh, these ideas of spatial analysis to things that are non-spatial. And then all this comes together into what is being termed these days as visual exploratory analysis, where you are not just looking at data in a static fashion, but are actually interactively exploring the data. So you're doing this dynamically, you're trying to build up an understanding, building that mental scaffold, if you will, by interacting and playing around with the data and perturbing it in different ways. And so this is really the advantage that you know, approaching descriptive analytics in this way really gives you versus somebody who's, uh, say, just doing straight business intelligence and reporting strictly from the database. This leads to the idea of data exploration versus data presentation, because visual exploratory analytics gives you this ability to figure out the answers to questions. And when you're exploring the data, you're really trying to build that mental scaffold about how and why things happened. But to be successful in business and in uh, essentially utilizing those analytics, you need to be able to present those results in a way that helps others understand it clearly. And so the second half of the course really moves on to showing the answers to questions. So distilling these visualizations and these concepts into something that's much easier to digest and to comprehend for somebody that doesn't necessarily have that training. And so that forms a big part of the course and we build analytical dashboards. This is actually a dashboard uh, built by a student in one of the previous classes. And report generation, where we go through the process of telling a story about that data in order to make a convincing argument about how and why things happened and what suggested courses of action to take. So again, this relates to wearing many hats and in the course, that's what we're trying to approach here. We're trying to give you a little bit of each of these quadrants in order to be the most effective in descriptive analytics, uh, rather than somebody that's strictly just dealing with programming databases or math and statistics, uh, and really emphasizing the fact that you need to be, uh, or need to be approaching descriptive analytics more holistically than rather as a technical pursuit. So let me go into a demo quickly about what types of software and techniques we'll be doing in the class, just so that you can get an idea about um, what that, the, the coursework will look like. And here I'll just be analyzing cryptocurrencies in Tableau. Uh, cryptocurrencies, um, for instance, are like Bitcoin, you see them in the news and they have wildly varying uh, prices over time. And they've gotten really, really popular. And the data is really uh, readily available these days. And it's kind of interesting to look at. So let's jump over to the software that we'll be using for the class, which is called Tableau. Now Tableau is a data workbench or analytical workbench along, along the lines of uh, many others that are out there, including Spotfire, uh, Alteryx, IBM Cognos. There's a whole number of these workbenches out there. And the advantage is, is that it gives you the ability to work with data akin to Excel, in that it gives you basically a spreadsheet-like view of the data, but it also gives you this ability to interact and play with the data and visualize it that you can't do so easily with pure tools like Excel or programming in Python or uh, straight up SQL. So the data set that we have here is actually a bunch of flat files. And these are all the price histories of these cryptocurrencies over time. And essentially we can just simply just drag them into our workspace and I've unioned them all together. And then I've joined it with a metadata table, which is just giving you information about these cryptocurrencies. So you can see that we have multiple data sets here and we can just interact with it um, like it is like a spreadsheet. But more interestingly is that without touching any code or writing any formulas, we can actually start to visualize and play with the data interactively. So for instance, I might want to see what these data sets look like, um, or let's say, let's just see a ranking, or let's go very to the very beginning, and let's just see what the data set looks like. So you can see that I'm just simply dragging these little capsules here into our little workspace, and we can immediately come up with these summary tables, which is pretty neat. 
And now I could do something like this and start to create tables that you would be accustomed to in say Excel. And you can see immediately it's given me a whole bunch of calculations without really doing any work. Now that's pretty neat, but it's not that interesting necessarily. Um, maybe you want to see it in different ways. Uh, we can start to visualize the data and play around with it all by dragging and dropping this interface here. And then we can of course undo everything that we've done. So let's say I wanted to look at um, the closing prices for all of these cryptocurrencies. We can do it very simply like this and we can see that uh, Bitcoin certainly dominates in price. Um, again, not that interesting and we'll rank it. What if we wanted to see the overall returns ranked? We can do so very, very easily. So you can see that we're not really writing any code. We're not having to manipulate spreadsheets and we're getting to solutions and answers very, very quickly without really having to do any work. And we can do this for all these things. We can look quickly at the average log returns. We can say, oh, well, instead of giving me the average log return, give me the standard deviation. And this gives me the deviation of returns. So if I were to build a portfolio of these cryptocurrencies, I can immediately begin to look at these statistical properties and say, well, what is, what is a better outcome? Uh, you know, investing heavily in Dogecoin and, and Shiba versus Bitcoin, or perhaps maybe, you know, I want to look at the medium of these. So we can get to these questions very, very quickly without doing a lot of work. And in this course, then we'll go through the analysis that looks um, essentially like playing around with the data in this manner. And the advantage is it lets us uh, do very, very quick manipulations again, without any work. And so I can build very, very quickly a uh, way to look at um, the distribution of all the returns of these cryptocurrencies. And I essentially create an interface, which you've seen while I've been talking within five seconds. So this is very, very powerful and it allows me to do very neat things. So I can even adjust this to allow for say multiple values and then now I can begin to compare distributions among different coins very, very quickly. To do this in say a database or in Excel would be actually pretty difficult um, with this amount of fluidity. So we can move on to things like time series analysis. Uh, again, we have these filters here, which lets us do neat things. And then we can immediately uh, change certain things and do calculations on top of it. So now this lets me look at very quickly comparisons between returns between all the cryptocurrencies given a particular starting date. So you can see how we're exploring the data in a very tangible and fluid way without having to get bogged down in the details about code, about uh, data structures, and lets us do really, really neat things. So now we have an example of multivariate analysis, moving on to um, looking at all the cross correlations through the scatter matrices. We can even add uh, more sophisticated calculations. Now this draws a linear trend line through it and it gives you the, the structure of the equations, as well as the ability to uh, compare um, individuals. And so the last example here, I'm sorry, I'm rushing through this a little bit, uh, but this one is, is a way that is an example of looking at the data in a way that, right? And so these previous examples, these are all the sort of the, the common template views of looking at data. And then this final one, we're looking at the Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency world as essentially a network. So if you have a network background or a graph theor theoretic background, you could model cryptocurrencies essentially as a closed economic environment where there's only a finite amount of coins, a uh, slightly growing uh, but finite amount of money moving in at any one time and money essentially moving or flowing between these coins as these giant hedge funds or individual investors move their money in between these various cryptos. So you can model it then as a network and then try to 
look at the change in flow over time over across this network, uh, essentially as a flow between these cryptos. And you can essentially uh, predict or look at patterns in the change of flow over time. So I think that's a pretty neat way of looking at descriptive analytics. Again, we're just looking at historically, that's not really done um, by everyone that's using the same uh, ty types of techniques and, and methods that you typically see in descriptive analytics. So this entire workbench lets you work very dynamically and in a very, very fluid manner. So that's really all that I wanted to cover uh, to give you a flavor about what's covered in this course. Um, I'm definitely open to any questions or, or comments at this time. Okay, if not, I'll hand the presentation back to Tiffany. Thanks for your time. Oh, thank you, James. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A function in the chat room, um, or we can, you, you can raise your hand and we can see if we can try and unmute you. <laughs> um, but I will go ahead and start sharing my screen again. Okay, so again, thank you, James. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed that presentation. Um, if you did, if you liked the little glimpse of what you would be learning in the descriptive analytics course, and um, we are offering the course this winter quarter, um, winter 2022, and those course dates are January 17th through March 13th. Um, this is the second course in the data analytics for business certificate program. Um, so in order to enroll into this course, there is a prerequisite of that intro course for so for any of you who are joining us who have already taken that introduction to analyzing data course, um, you you have that like pre like that background now in order to enroll into the into the descriptive analytics course. Um, so if you want to, we encourage you to. Um, as James mentioned throughout his presentation, um, the course really goes through like what is happening and how you can picture um, and basically visualize that data in order to make it available to those individuals who might not have that technical in a background of, okay, I need to look at this and I don't really know how to read it. So it's really all about interpreting your data and selling everyone on it. Um, so again, those course dates are January 17th through March 13th, and you can enroll on our website, ce.uci.edu. And if we have any new individuals um, who have not taken any courses with us, and after this uh, webinar, you're saying, oh my gosh, this is so interesting. I want to enroll into the program. And we're also running our introduction course um, of our data analytics program. And those course dates are January 10th through March 6th. And in this course, um, you're basically learning the fundamentals of analyzing data. Um, and then you'll get like a quick overview of the different types of analytics. Um, but it, it won't be very specific. And so that's what basically you go into when you take these individual descriptive and um, predictive and prescriptive courses. Okay, so I will um, open the floor up for any questions. Um, these can be questions um, for James. He is the instructor teaching in winter. So if you have questions about descriptive analytics, about um, Tableau, the tool he was using, um, or about his presentation, I encourage you all to ask them. Um, if you have questions about the program themselves, like itself, you can ask me and I'm more than happy to answer. Okay, I do see a few questions coming in. Um, let's see. So here, what about if you have not taken the prerequisite course, um, but have taken several other UCI data science courses? Um, yes, so the, if you want to take the descriptive analytics course, like I mentioned, that intro course is a prerequisite. Um, however, if you have already taken data science courses and you feel like you have um, that like knowledge already to not take the intro course, um, then you can go ahead and contact me. You can send me an email. Um, I will type my email in the chat um, and just let me know and we can discuss perhaps substituting a more rigorous course. Um, we don't want you to have to take a more basic course if you've already taken rigorous courses. Um, that's definitely not what we want to do for you. Um, so yeah, I will go ahead and type my email in the chat. Um, and go ahead and send me an email, we can discuss that. Any other questions about the program, about the presentation? I'll give a few, a few more minutes so that the questions can come in. Um, 
James, quick question for you. Um, what would you say, um, like with students who have taken visualization courses, what do you think is one of like the main takeaways that they have from these courses? Like something they perhaps were not expecting to say, you know what, like that was, I did not know that I needed to know that. Like that was very interesting. That was a surprise to me. I think we'll see that there's many visualization types that we that are not covered in other visualization classes. And once you learn the grammar of graphics, then you'll see that there's many different ways of view data that are not your standard bar graph, histogram, line chart, or other types of graphs that are commonly out there. And you can be a lot more creative. So that's sort of the first half of the course is trying to be creative with visualizing data. And then the second half, where I feel a lot of students suddenly, uh, you know, basically had an, uh, a, a provoking insight is that presenting data and presenting the analytics is a real challenge and not everyone is very good at that. And so that takes a lot of expertise and, and basically a way of thinking about how to present it for somebody that's non-technical. And so I think uh, that is really um, an aspect of visualization that is not covered by uh, necessarily many other classes. Yeah, thank you. And we do have another question here. Um, will we receive a copy of the PowerPoint presentation? Um, I can go ahead and email um, everyone who did attend a copy of our slides. That way um, you, you can review everything that we went through. Okay, we have another question in the chat room. Um, I work full time, how much time per week on average would students spend um, on these courses in the certificate program? Um, so that will vary with student. Um, some students may come in with a little bit more knowledge, with a little bit more experience in the data analytics world. Um, but we tell students um, to account for about six to 10 hours a week on each course. Um, again, that will vary if you are really getting something one week, then that may be um, less time, there may be some weeks that you say, you know what, this is actually a lot, so you may want to spend a little bit more time, um, but we usually say on average six to 10 hours per week. Any other questions? About James' presentation, the program, or the world of analytics itself. <laughs> James is an expert here. Okay, so there's a question a question about um, Tableau, about the licensing. Um, so we will provide um, access to Tableau in the course. Um, so you won't have to worry about getting all of that yourself beforehand. Um, of course, if you already have it, you can use that, but we will provide uh, a licensing for that. And then you'll get more information on that on the first day of class. Okay, I think we may be done with questions. Um, I will maybe wait a few more seconds in case some individuals are gathering their thoughts. Um, while we do that, um, James, do you have any en ending remarks maybe about the course, about the world of descriptive analytics itself? Um, <laughs> not per se, but I, I think, um... For the course, I think um, a lot of people have some worries about, you know, how much effort and work it takes. And just rest assured that I'm here to help you as much as possible and basically hold your hand through the course if you need it or challenge you if you need it and provide additional resources, essentially, that might not be covered in the course. So you have access to essentially everything that I know and have experienced. And I'm always here for any of the students. Uh, in whatever regard uh, related to analytics. And so I know a lot of students in the past courses had many, many questions related to their particular um, business or organization. And I'm definitely more to than willing to help out in any capacity on analytical um, you know, problems or stumbling blocks that people have in their own uh, personal struggles. So that's just something to toss out there. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. I'm that um, leads me to add that, um, like I mentioned, all of these courses are online, um, but they are all instructor led. Um, so in each course, you will have a wonderful instructor um, like James, who are all industry experts. Um, and they are all here for you. Um, if you have any questions, if you're struggling with anything, they're more than happy um, to help you through it, like James mentioned. 
Um, so we do have a few more questions. Um, James, I'll, I'll let you take this one. Um, is the entire course in Tableau or do you have to use um, any other software like R, Python, SAS? No, we're gonna uh, stay strictly in Tableau. And, um, you know, you might have to use Excel just to open the data to look at it, um, but really Tableau is the only requirement. You don't have to know code, you don't have to do SQL, um, only Tableau. Thank you. And then we have um, a few questions about um, our healthcare analytics program. Um, so we have an individual asking the difference between that program and the business analytics program. Um, Julie, if you wanna go ahead and take this one. <laughs> sure, um, thank you for your question. So the healthcare analytics program is very um, predictive specific. A lot of it um, focuses on predicting um, results for improved healthcare. Healthcare has specific requirements only because they do pertain to someone's health and certain predictive markers or, um, you know, certain analytical markers, which contain a lot of restrictions. So it does focus on those policies as well as um, those specific like predictive analytics parameters that you would look for, especially when you're dealing with someone's health. It also includes a lot of, um, you know, the policies according to HIPAA and how you can actually run um, your analytics um, for um, specific research components. So that's the major difference. Um, as concerning the um, Tableau in healthcare analytics, I do believe um, you do run into Tableau. You will not use it super extensively. Um, as far as I know, it uses mainly predictive analytics um, tools. And I know that NIME is used and um, I do know that they will also be using, um, oh geez, I'm forgetting the name of it, um, but um, SPSS um, and some SAS as well. So, um, as well as R. Um, uh, the predictive, or I'm sorry, the healthcare analytics program does not sit in tech programs. Um, so I would definitely recommend that you contact the um, program coordinator for that program or the program manager. I believe it is still Jackie Badwa. And I'd be happy to send you um, their information or her information um, if you would like to contact them. Thank you, Julie. Um, any other questions? I don't see any queued up. Um, so I will wait like a few more seconds. Okay, um, if there is nothing else, um, thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you, James, for that wonderful presentation. I have walked out feeling like I can conquer descriptive analytics myself. Um, again, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. I will go back a few slides. That way you can um, take a um, image of this slide. It has my contact information, Julie's contact information, along with our department email address. Um, please feel free to send us any questions. Um, and thank you again for joining us.